Good morning. Uh, welcome to this much awaited autumn talk focusing on the regulation of short term lets. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Fergus Ewan, Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy, in a few minutes. If anybody has any questions for Mr Ewan, please do submit them now. There's a panel to the right of your screen. If you just add them into the little questions section, we'll be able to put those to Mr Ewing in a very short time. I'd like to, as ever, thank our valued partners for business, Super Control, Cumberland Business, Bruce Stevenson, Discover Scotland, Home Away, Into Home, and DM Hall, and of course our sponsors at Tunnocks and Visit Scotland, without whom none of this would be happening. We're incredibly grateful for your continued support and backing. We're living through incredibly challenging times. I don't need to tell you that. Tourism has been one of the hardest hit sectors, and we continue to be faced with increasing restrictions despite a welcome and fragile start after lockdown. As you'll know, we've just submitted, we've just published a survey. 71% of self-caterers have reported a negative financial impact on their businesses since the new restrictions were announced last week, with over half expecting further, further cancellations and 15% believing that their businesses are no longer viable. Worse still, nearly one in 10 have already had to let staff go and over half have reported suffering mental health effects. Despite this, we're still faced with the prospect of a fairly heavy-handed licensing scheme being introduced, while we're still trying to navigate through a global pandemic and save our businesses and livelihoods. We're delighted to be joined today by Andrew Mott, Chair of the Scotland government, Scottish Government's Short-Term Let Delivery Group, who's here to discuss the regulation of short-term lets. In July of 2020, the Scottish Government announced that they were resuming their plans, first unveiled back in 2020, January, for the introduction of a licensing system, planning control areas, and a review of the tax treatment of short-term lets. We're in the middle of a very period, short period of consultation, just four weeks, which provides an opportunity to assess and refine the detail of the regulations to ensure that there's an appropriate balance between the needs of local communities and Scotland's important tourist economy. This is a unique opportunity for you to hear firsthand what the delivery group is planning. But before we look, start looking at regulations, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Tourism, and MSP for Inverness and Nairn. Mr Ewing has been tireless in his support for tourism in Scotland, and a firm supporter of the self-catering sector prior to and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd personally like to thank him for everything that he has and continues to do to help each and every one of us here today. You've been a great friend of the self-catering sector, and we're very grateful for your friendship. Cabinet Secretary, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, well thank you very much indeed, Fiona, and, and, uh, and good afternoon to all your members. And I'm very pleased that Andrew Mott is giving a presentation on the, the letting um, proposals and regime. And just let me say at the outset that um, I'm very keen to continue a close interest in these regulations to make sure that they're, they're not unduly burdensome uh, and that they don't pose a problem to legitimate and bona fide businesses. And I think most of your members, almost all of your members, fall into that category. So I, I won't comment more on that, except that I will continue to engage with Andrew to try to make sure that the regulations, when they're implemented, which uh, won't be for some considerable time yet, uh, they are done so in a user friendly, business, business friendly, Way and I guess Fiona, you know, my views are coloured because, um, you know, as you can tell, I've I've been around a bit. Um, in in fact, when I was in the Scottish Parliament in a debate on tourism, I did point out that to the presiding officer, which was a bit cheeky of me, that between us we we covered well over a century of lifetime experience between Ken McIntosh and myself, and I did spend about 20 years running a business. So I remember the joys and the tribulations, the worries, the sleepless nights, the overdrafts, the good times. A, the the staff the the kind of uh, the pleasure of running your own business is is manifest but the the pressures on business now have never been greater than at any time in my lifetime and I say that as someone who you know for the last 21 years as an MSP and 13 years as a minister um, have been largely involved in trying to help promote, create, preserve, sustain business. And tourism has been right at the heart. And, you know, it's been moving up the charts towards the number one spot, really, 
you know, with uh, I think well over 200,000 people, one in 12 people employed in tourism in one way or another. And also the quality of offering, Fiona, that your members in particular are offering the public is, is immense. And I say that in my family, myself, have had um, had one foreign holiday in the last 12 years. I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. It was before I was tourism minister <laughs> to, to France. Uh, one in England and the rest have been actually in self-catering properties, mostly in the Western Isles. And, you know, it's an enchanting way, relaxing way to have a family holiday. There's no two ways about it. I do actually think that, um, you know, one positive from this, if in a perverse kind of way, is that because fewer people in future will, certainly for the short and possibly medium term, be willing to go on air travel that more people will want a staycation and a large proportion of those may well choose your members and i think to some extent that has been happening i'd be most interested in in your thoughts on that um so the tourism has been a mainstay of the of the scottish economy uh, and more important than that a, a kind of area of entrepreneurialism of imagination innovation of care for customers to give them a great experience and it's a kind of people business as well i mean people in tourism you know tend to be extrovert um good at dealing with people enjoying dealing with people otherwise you know why would you be in tourism so all in all um i i think the 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 past 10 years or so have been very very positive and along comes covid and spoils it all and it really has been a harrowing time for for all of your members i do appreciate that and therefore since march um you know a huge proportion of my time has been spent on trying to respond first of all in the financial support packages um the financial support packages were tremendously important i was pleased that the grant finance proceeded initially that we go over a hiccup about entitlement about multiple properties we sorted that one out i think you know we didn't get it quite right so we sorted it um, since then, we've had the um, the other funds um, available, the UK funds, which have been welcomed, the furlough scheme, the bounce back loans, the pivotal fund, the creative and hardship fund, the self catering uh, and B&B provision. Um, all of these have, I think, served a purpose. I think maybe they're a bit of a broad brush. And I know that, that there are some people who feel that they were left out. And, you know, I, I'm really sorry about that. I think most people in, in tourism that are running proper tourism businesses, as opposed to somebody that you know lets out a flat in Glasgow on Airbnb for you know for 10 or 10 or 20 days a year, that's not really a business. We didn't think that the desirability of providing financial support to people for whom um, this was an incidental income was correct. The support was there to provide um, mitigation against real financial hardship that's Fiona I think as you know what we were trying to achieve standing back from the specific schemes it was to alleviate hardship hardship such that it was so bad that it would threaten the survival of the very business uh, and really at the moment with the continuing restrictions and social distancing impacting many many sectors the event sector the conference sector and aviation have been really, really hard hit. Hotels, particularly in cities, um, are suffering occupancy rates which are not, in most cases, sufficient to break even. And we haven't yet come to the quiet part of the, the year in terms of seasonality either. Um, so, you know, I'm conscious that the sector, frankly, has never faced greater challenges. To address part of these, Fiona, we, we, we have had the a, a task force and that, that has brought people together, over 30 people actually, and each having a, an input and particular area of knowledge, expertise and experience. I think that will be a, a, a very positive document, setting out a lot of ideas for the future. You know, for example, to boost the Rural, rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund to deal with some of the, the so-called camping issues that have happened over the summer with increased stress, particularly in pressurised areas, but also addressing aviation taxation investment demand stimulation training all these areas it has been a very good um group and i'm very hopeful that the report will be used as a lever particularly 
in persuading our UK government colleagues um, to recognise the huge importance to Britain of tourism. I know that in London they're having very similar problems to Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example. So it's on London's doorstep. I, I don't think that this is an issue that will readily be um, ignored by Westminster. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I've got good, good relations with Nigel Huddleston, the UK Tourism Minister, and we have had fairly constructive relations throughout, and that will continue. Um, and I think he, he kind of gets it, as it were. I want just to turn to the COVID restrictions, because I know that this issue has caused, as you mentioned in your opening um, introductory remarks, a real hardship. And, um, you know, believe me, a, no one in government is more acutely aware of this than me. And first of all, I do want to apologise for the confusion that arose over a period of 24 hours following the immediate announcement. Um, when major changes are announced by the First Minister, there is always what I would call a plume of decisions about the nature of the change, how they apply, the detail of how they apply. And I have to say, we didn't handle that well. Um, I hold my hands up to that. I'm the minister. I'm responsible for what happens. And um, there was a period of confusion. And I think the most irritating thing for your members about this was that hopes were raised and then dashed. And that's never a good thing. Believe me, that's something I really try to avoid as a minister has been around the block a while. Um, but, but on the other hand, this is the problem we've got that that we are in a situation where the numbers, as we all know, have been rising massively. The number today is, is pretty frightening. Um, the numbers have been rising, and you've all seen the press speculation about more restrictions um, coming in. Um, and you know, I, I think the, the, there is not a huge likelihood of the loosening of restrictions in the, in the short-term future, simply because the alarming increase in numbers. Um, there is a question about data. You know, what is the data that suggests that tourism and in particular self-catering is a greater risk than hotels? And also the comparison with England. And I, I get that as well. Um, so, yes, it is absolutely essential to look at data. But we but we, we have, as a government, collectively taken these decisions in order to try to protect public health. And that is the driver. Uh, and I think we can all see that the First Minister is entirely sincere and straightforward about her approach to this and as transparent as possible. And I can assure everybody that nothing is done and no restriction is imposed unless it is felt on the basis of the medical and expert public health advice that we have with regard to the particular statistics and data that we have in Scotland that it is necessary. No restrictions are imposed unless they are perceived to be absolutely necessary. Um, and we are working with with you with the UK, uh, obviously, all the time to try to drive down the virus and deal with its consequences as best we can. Sadly, the casualties over the recent time have included some of your members, uh, and I am frankly sorry about that. I don't want to beat about the bush and give you kind of evasive political style arguments where you try and pass the buck off to somebody else. I'm not going to do that. What I will say is that, you know, I'm determined that as soon as we possibly can, we move to lift the restrictions. Um, and that the arguments, particularly the detailed arguments around tourism, are always put to my colleagues, both at Cabinet and at the various other meetings we have, including an economy minister's meeting we had, and we had a Cabinet meeting this morning as well. Um, so I took the opportunity to update colleagues about tourism and the fact that the latest restrictions have had a pretty serious impact on your members and in relation to the 10 o'clock curfew as well. Um, so, you know, please be assured that the voice of tourism is being put forward. But in the scheme of things at the moment, it is trying to protect against the virus that is really occupying our uh, the, the large part of the government's focus and attention, as I think, I hope, people would recognise is correct. So I think in, the, in conclusion, Fiona, I'll be happy to answer any questions or that your members have for the next five minutes or so, but in conclusion, you know, I do think that in the medium to, to certainly in the short, to, in the medium to, to kind of longer term, the next two or three years, 
I, I think that uh, the self-catering sector will probably see an enhancement in the numbers of customers because of ongoing concerns about exposing families to air travel and the perceived risks that some people will continue to associate with that. Of course, if a vaccine comes along, that would be a game changer and very welcome. But I do think in the medium term, there are cause for optimism. But we do have a duty to work with you to get you through the difficulties at the moment, uh, difficulties that none of us, I, I, I feel, suspected would have been around for so long. But, but sadly, we are where we are, and we have to play the cards as, uh, as they are dealt. So in conclusion, I'm very happy to, to answer questions and also to continue, Fiona, to work with you. Obviously, you've been a forthright and very effective voice for self-catering and have gained the, the respect of the, uh, my officials and uh, my colleagues in government. Thank you. Thank you. That's, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's incredibly welcome. Your words are, are comforting. I suppose our biggest concern at this moment is, yes, we, we appreciate that our more than likely to see a very big increase in confidence for our sector quite rightly so going forward our concern at the moment is getting to that point where our businesses can survive that long if i'm absolutely honest and i can say that as a personal uh, business owner that's operating been operating for 18 years and i'm being faced with the most catastrophic devastating impact on my own business so I can say it from a personal point of view as well as, as the Chief Exec of the ASSC. I suppose that brings us on to one of the biggest questions that's coming out just now, is that the meeting here today is to talk about the regulations and the proposed licensing of short-term letting. Is this really the time to be doing this? Well, I, I understand. That's Absolutely, that, 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 that question. I mean, plainly, the, the government has set a timetable so that's the policy but you know what i would undertake is that um you know obviously andrew mott will give a presentation and i and i i do hope that the presentation will will allow um many to form the conclusion that although these regulations are not what anyone is particularly wanting one they're not coming in for a while and two um they they shouldn't really in implementation be any more onerous than the than as far as I can see than the registration process for landlords of domestic property. I mean, as it happens, and it's in my interest declaration. You know, I own a small house in Lossiemouth, which I've let out for about 12, 13 years now, and um, you have to every year um, pay, I think, a couple of hundred pounds to the local authority uh, to register as a landlord of. Uh, a domestic of a property that's let as a domestic dwelling house to a tenant. Um, I don't regard that. I mean, it's you know, it's one of these things in life you have to do. I don't regard it as an enormous problem. It doesn't keep me awake at night. So I hope I'm hoping that Andrew will give you that message. But and this is the point. Um, also, Lindsay Little is on the call from my tourism officials, and I'll be asking Lindsay to report back to me in order that I can consider if further representations need to be made to my colleagues about, for example, the timescale for this, you know, in terms of the timescale for implementation. Because if you decide that you would really like this off the agenda for a year or so, if that's the tack you take, then plainly it would be my role to, um, to set out the arguments for that and put them to colleagues. Um, decisions have to be taken at a collegiate level at the end of the day. There's no point in having a team and giving different messages out. That's that's a, a recipe for um, a for disaster in politics and probably any other team. Frankly, you don't you want to kick the ball towards the goal of uh, the opponents, not kick your own players. So, so I'm not about to start kicking my own team, but I do, as somebody formerly in business, do recognise that. You know that that this is 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 uh, something which um, your members will be a bit apprehensive about. I'm hoping those apprehensions can be dealt with, but if they can't be, and you have reasonable concerns, my job is to put these across, and I will. Excellent. That's the best thing I've heard for about a month and a half. Um, we would love this to be firmly taken off the table, please. Um, Miss Hugh, I know that you've got other engagements, so I don't want to hold you up. And I know that my members will be 
deeply concerned about the regulations and wanting to hear from Andrew Mott. So I'd just like to thank you from all of us okay. for taking that today and we will no doubt be in touch. Thank you thank so much. Thank, thank you, Fiona. Thank, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you and all the best. I'd now really love to welcome Andrew Mott. Andrew is responsible for housing market policy across Scotland and for affordable homes delivery in the north of Scotland. Good afternoon, Andrew. Andrew's worked in Scottish Government since 2001, having previously worked on policy and delivery in mental health, transport, education, protection of vulnerable groups and domestic energy efficiency. He's the chair of the short term let delivery group for your sins, Andrew. And I'm just going to hand you straight in to see what you have to say on these proposed regulations. Fiona, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you all. I feel like the pantomime villain today, but um, thank you. And um, it's obviously apparent from uh, what Mr Ewing has said that you, you have um, uh, a, a powerful ally in government. We are um, all, what we all work together and we're trying to deliver the best kind of results for Scotland as a whole. So um, uh, I, th I hope that's a, a sort of encouraging start. Um, what I'm going to do is, is uh, we published our consultation paper on the 14th of September and it closes on the 16th of October. So that is um, four to five weeks to, to consider it. What I'm going to do is just talk through that consultation paper and then I think Fiona will ask me some questions on the behalf of, of people who have maybe submitted them already and then maybe others will submit some during the course of the, of the talk. So um, I will I'll just give a brief summary for those of you who maybe um, haven't read the paper yet and, and that might help frame the discussion. So um, the Minister, Mr Stewart, the Housing Minister who leads on this, um, announced in Parliament on the 8th of January, he announced three measures, um, a licensing scheme, uh, control areas under the planning legislation and um, a review of taxation. This uh, consultation deals with the planning and licensing provisions only. The review of taxation uh, is out of scope. Um, there's nothing uh, to say on that right now. It's, there's still work in progress, but we haven't um, reached any uh, definitive kind of point on that. So I'm going to talk about the licensing and planning uh, provisions only today. The um, consultation paper, the, the meat of it, sets out three things really. The first is what is a short term let? So it's uh, some definitional points. Um, then it talks about control areas and then it talks about the licensing scheme. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of those um, things. So in terms of a short-term let, it's defined, there's five uh, elements to the definition. The first is, and, and these are hopefully not too big a surprise, um, the first is that it's residential, so it's made to one or more guests for them to reside at the accommodation. The second is the accommodation is all or part of a house or flat or service department. So it's what most people would understand to be um, residential accommodation. The third condition is it's temporary. So it's not the guest's own or principal home. And the reason we've taken that uh, approach is to dovetail with the private rented sector legislation, which focuses um, on accommodation, which is the guest's own or principal home. So the private rented sector uh, provisions cover um, tenancies um, where, it's, where people normally live, and this covers um, staying somewhere which is not where you normally live, basically. So, um, so, so far we've got residential um, uh, accommodation, it's temporary, but the fourth condition is it's commercial, so it's either for money or for benefit in kind. Now that could include swapping, so if you let out your home to somebody in return for staying in theirs, that would be seen as a benefit in kind. And then the, the final thing is it excludes immediate family. So if you rent a place to your father or mother or whatever, that wouldn't be counted as a short term let. And just to be clear, it includes lets for work or leisure purposes. So it doesn't really matter why. Um, and uh, it, we're not proposing to include um, unconventional dwellings such as caravans, pods, mobile dwellings, 
canal boats, etc. So we are um, talking about um, things that look like homes, if you see what I mean. So having defined what a short-term let is, it's kind of useful to distinguish between three different um, types. So the first is home sharing, which is where uh, you let out a room or rooms in your own home when you are there. Then there's home letting, when you let out the place that you normally live, but when you're not there. And then there's secondary letting, which is letting out um, a whole property where you don't normally live. And that's obviously what self-catering normally involves. So um, most of you will be doing what we call secondary letting in this consultation paper. Now, um, oh, right, so I think I'll, so that's the kind of definitional side. So the next thing is to talk about um, control areas. Now, control areas are uh, a new power that will be given to local authorities. And um, at the moment, whether or not you need planning permission to operate um, a short-term let is, is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and different local authorities will have different guidance on that. What a control area does is it just says that within that area, within the area that the local authority designates, planning permission would always be required to um, use a whole property for short-term letting. So it's simply, it's a bit, it's rather like conservation areas. So, you know, if you want to change a, a building, sometimes you require planning permission, but in a conservation area, you always require it. And it's the same kind of um, principle. And um, so now whether a local authority um, introduces one or not, or, or several, is that to them. So some local authorities might not bother to use this power at all because they don't need it, and others might, others, and, and they may have one or more uh, depending on the, the activity in their area. The purpose of control areas is, is to help manage high concentrations of secondary letting if it affects the, the availability of residential housing or the character of the neighbourhood. And, and it may be used potentially to restrict or prevent short-term lets in places or types of building where it's not appropriate. And it allows local, it helps local authorities to ensure that homes are used to best effect in their areas. So that's um, what a control area is. And, um, so in a control area, if a control area is designated and you want to do short-term letting, you'd need planning permission. Um, the fact it's a control area doesn't mean it would necessarily be refused. It just means that the planning application will be determined in accordance with the local development plans. Um, so local authorities might choose to set out policies um, uh, about how short-term lets will be sort of considered in their area. And then um, just Finally, the, the, the meat of the, um, the consultation paper, the, the, the biggest chapter is the one at the end about the licensing scheme. And that's probably what we'll talk about most today, I'd imagine. So um, every local authority will be required to set up a licensing scheme. And, and there are some mandatory conditions that are basically about safety that um, every short-term net in Scotland will need to comply with. So every short-term let, whether it's home sharing, home letting or secondary letting, will need a license in due course. Now at the moment the sector is, is largely unregulated. Um, what, the, what the licensing scheme uh, does, uh, and it's, it's under the 1982 Civic Government Scotland Act, will set out, and, and the consultation paper talks about this, the, the kind of application process and application fee, the mandatory safety conditions, some discretionary conditions that local authorities might um, choose to apply if that's needed in their areas, but they they, they may not. Obviously, it's worth, um, you all know, but um, the, it, Scotland is very diverse. So, you know, the, the, the kind of short-term letting that takes place in city centre Edinburgh is very different to the East Nuke of Fife, which is very different to Skye, which is very different to um, the Cairngorms, etc. So there's, there's there's huge variety, and one of the things we're we're trying to do with a local authority implemented scheme is allow local authorities to tailor what they do to their local area. Um, so so it's quite um, it's meant to be empowering for local authorities to do what they 
kind of need to do. The mandatory safety elements are really there because um, when we did our 2019 consultation and research, we found that there was a lot of uncertainty about safety. Uh, so so in, uh, I'm sure that uh, an awful lot of people listening to this um, uh, webinar, if you want, by the, by the fact you've even tuned in and the fact you're part of a membership organisation, you, you're diligently trying to do the right thing. But we have to acknowledge that out there, there are some people who um, are, don't know the right thing to do and are not doing it. And at the, at the minority end, there's some people who negligently or deliberately just don't particularly care. So um, the, 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 we, we need to think about what protects the safety of guests across the piece. Um, so, uh, and you know, that, that's, that's true of any system, isn't it? It's true of driving, it's true of all sorts of things. Um, you know, the vast majority of people want to do the right thing. Some people need more information to do the right thing. Um, and then there's one or two who don't, who don't really care. So, um, uh, yes, what else to say? So um, that's what uh, the licensing scheme kind of uh, does. It's worth saying that um, my final bit of introductory um, uh, remarks are that, just to give you an idea of the timetable, so um, we're working on preparing these statutory instruments that will set up the licensing scheme and control areas, and we plan to put them to Parliament in December. Um, that's with a view to them completing their pa parliamentary passage in this session. As you know, there's an election next May, so Parliament, the session ends um, in, at the end of March, I think. Um, so the, the idea is that the, the legislation will come into force on the 1st of April. Now, in terms of the control areas, local authorities may or may not decide to progress with them. So they'll, they'll be on a sort of track that's entirely up to local authorities. In terms of the licensing scheme, it's one thing to have the legislation in place, but then there's um, local authorities will need time to set up their own scheme, never mind um, operators. So um, what we're going to say is, is that local authorities have a year to set up um, a licensing scheme. So the idea is that by the 1st of April 2022, every local authority should have a licensing scheme that's open for applications. And then we acknowledge that for existing operators, they'll need time to get an application in. So local authorities will be able to set a grace period of up to a year to allow existing operators to um, put an application in. And during the time that their application is in, they can continue to operate. So there's no there's no delay um, for those of you, you know, all of you on the call by definition already operating. So there's no there's no delay there at all. Um, you'll put your application in, and then the lo local authorities will obviously have a um, some of them will have quite a lot of applications to process. So there's a further grace period for them to process their applications. So the kind of ultimate date by which every short-term lecture be licensed isn't until the 31st of March 2024, which is over three years down the line. So um, that's that's the timeline. Um, it's a pity I can't see you all, I'm speaking into the void, but um, I know that um, Fiona has had some um, questions sent in from some of you, and I think we'll go through them uh, next, and then we can, I can obviously try I can only try to answer other questions. So I may not know the answer to everything, I'm, I'm, uh, but I'll do my best to, 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 to give an answer where I can. So um, Fiona, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate you coming here today and giving us the opportunity to ask you some questions rather than you asking us the questions all the time. It's really, really welcome. You know perfectly well the ASCC's had still has sincere concerns about the proposals and um, we've offered alternative options and we will continue to work with you to make those options more appealing and possibly adopted. Um, you know, and what, what we want to do is, is find the solutions to the policy issues that are trying to be addressed. You know, we do believe that this is a very heavy handed approach and we will continue to work with you to try and offer alternatives. 
anybody that's on this webinar or, or watching this, um, you can see what the SSC has proposed on our website. And we'd really urge you to familiarise yourselves with these before you submit a response to the consultation. We've gone for some quite um, innovative approaches I think should be welcomed by an innovative government, which is what the Scottish government is, isn't it, Andrew? Um, in advance yes. of the webinar, we thank you. In advance of this webinar, we asked for some questions, and we have been inundated with questions. So we've also got loads of questions from today, and I just want to reassure you that we're not going to be able to get through all of them today, but they will all be compiled and handed over to the short-term delivery group, and we will hopefully publish those answers in due course as part of this consultation process. So, Andrew, um, I hope you guys have got some time on your hands because we've got a few questions for you. <laughs> anyway, in advance, we'll start at the beginning. Here's one. The 2020 to 2021 programme for government said that the plans for the transit visitor levy was, were put on hold due to COVID-19 and that future consideration of the levy will not will take account of the changed context the industry is operating in. Why isn't this the case for short-term let regulations? Okay, just actually, just before I start answering the, question, the questions, I would just like to say to, to everybody listening that Fiona does a great job in making the case for self-caterers to the Scottish Government, and we have had a number of um, good and productive discussions over the last couple of years, and we are listening carefully so um there's obviously a difference of view as to you know the, the approach with these um uh, regulations but uh we do want to listen and what what's very helpful for us is to get into the detail rather than um some people say they're burdensome and other people say uh, or us to say they're not what's really good is to get into the detail of what's what's a problem and how to make it work for everybody so that's just my kind of i forgot to say that really but we have we do have kind of very productive conversations and fiona makes your your case very well so um be in no doubt that we have that um very constructive and robust um conversation ongoing on this one um so uh, the, the, why are we on this timeline? Well, as I, what, what's very difficult is that um, the overwhelming majority of, of guests and hosts um, behave responsibly, but there are some that don't. And for the, for the, for the neighbours and um, the nearby residents of the people that don't, it really is a very difficult problem. What well, one one of the uh, things. Um, is that uh, politicians get an awful lot of correspondence as you know and and the, i think the the biggest issue is housing and prior to covid the biggest issue within housing was actually people really suffering with some bad examples of short-term lets so for those people the, the kind of um the regulation can't come soon enough one of the things that um uh we want to do is 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 get on with getting the the SSIs into Parliament in this session so that we we can start that process. Um, and what I've tried what I tried to convey when I was talking about the transitional arrangements is I, I absolutely fully appreciate, and you can hear that Mr. Ewing fully appreciates too, that um, you guys have an awful lot on your plate right now with the whole COVID um, pandemic. And that's not just self-caterers. I mean, the, lots of people are, are under pressure with that. But we're not asking anybody out there to do anything right now. If, if you look at the, the kind of timeline we're talking about, it's quite some time down the line before anybody's filling in an application for, for license. And for those of you who, um, I mean, I would expect this applies to everybody on this call, actually, um, that the kind of things we're asking are the kind of things that I'm sure you do and have done. So um, making sure that the electrical safety, the gas safety, fire safety. It really, if you look at the annex in the consultation paper, the kind of things that we're we're actually asking for. I think it's right at the end, annex C. It's a is the, the kind of checklist. It's quite hard to argue that any of these things are, I think, particularly onerous. So you know, 
is the, is the place in a good state of repair? You know, most of you, all of you on this call will, I'm sure, want for your own reasons to ensure your property is well maintained. Um, safety awareness, gas safety, carbon monoxide, electrical safety, smoke detectors, furnishings, that's just making sure that they are fire resistant. All, all furnishings have that label. Yes, sorry. Can I, do, can I just jump yeah. in? I mean, I think one of the fundamental yes. problems is that every single person on this call will have all of that totally covered off. We are already right. firmly, firmly regulated as a sector. We, are, we have our own specific fire regulations. We have antisocial noise regulations. We have an entire brief of regulations that we already comply with. So Annex C is simply not a problem, although we are excluded from the repairing standard because it's so far below what we provide as accommodation. We were excluded from it in 2019 via legislation. So that's the one point I would make about that. But my point is that we already do all of this. So the policy intention of health and safety should be delivered to those that are running amateur operations temporarily. But the people that do it professionally, the people on this call, already do all of this. So why do we then have to add in another regulatory layer? We already pay our taxes. We already do everything that we need to do to comply with the safety of our guests. It seems extraordinary that you're trying to introduce something which just seems to be another layer to people that provide completely professional operations. And just, just sorry to, another question is the health and safety element. We would all completely agree that health and safety of guests is absolutely paramount. So one question that we've had today is how was the evidence gathered to come to the conclusion that health and safety is a serious concern? And that runs into another question why is this licensing scheme not going to apply to unconventional accommodation like caravans and yurts which could be argued that provide more of a risk to guests hosts and communities so that's two questions and a small rant over to you okay well i mean what i would say is that i'm i'm confident that that, that people on this call by definition of taking such an interest are already doing their best to comply with all these these conditions but the, but what we have to remember is there are quite a few people out there who maybe don't and aren't and um so for, for people who are already on the ball this really isn't onerous at all because a lot of the application form will be just ticking a box so for example you know that the relevant tax will be paid bit it's just ticking a, a t there'll be a sentence a declaration you just tick that box for example things like making sure that you've um your mortgage or your tenancy allows you to do it is something that is to be honest you should, should be doing anyway so um our argument would be that for the people who are um the people who are already diligent and care and have high standards there's not a lot for them to do for the but it, what it, this will do is pick up the people in the in the who either are unaware or don't care, and it'll bring them into a regime where you know that won't be okay anymore. So, so I, I, my you know passionate argument would be that the, the people, the, the if you like, the professionals doing the right thing have absolutely nothing to to fear from this. Um, a bit like Mr. Unless, Ewing was saying about his. Unless you live in Edinburgh unless you live in Edinburgh, at which point our deep concern is that the City of Edinburgh Council, in their infinite wisdom, will use this as a, a way to providing a de facto ban to short-term letting in Edinburgh. And that goes back to another question, is, is this not just an Edinburgh problem, but you're rolling it out across the whole of Scotland? And why is a license necessary rather than a registration scheme with mandatory health and safety? elements to it uh, which we wouldn't okay. be well just, a, just just on that just on the edinburgh whole of scotland point um there are obviously places in scotland where the, the volume of short-term lets seems to cause a lot of concern and places where it doesn't one of the reasons why we've taken the approach of empowering local authorities rather than set up a sort of um national scheme that sort of says everything is that 
we want local authorities to be able to do what's right in their area. And, and something to reassure people, uh, you know, self-caterers and others providing accommodation, is that tourism uh, is very important to, to local authorities and to local economies. Nobody's going to want to shoot themselves in the foot on this. So um, Edinburgh, uh, it's no surprise that you know there are concerns about some concentrations of activity in some areas but equally um, Edinburgh benefits greatly from the Edinburgh Festival and for, from other big events and from visitors coming to um, Edinburgh all, you know, all, all year round and um, so, so Edinburgh is not going to want to sort of um, kill off its tourism industry and, 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 and some, something else to, to, to sort of bear in mind is that to a certain extent local authorities um, compete with each other for um, uh, tourists so, so, so when people visit Scotland why do they go to this place and not that place so there's, there, there are some natural mechanisms that, that no, nobody's going to want to over regulate on this it, it's in nobody's interest to do that but, but the Scottish government's position is simply that safety very basic safety requirements are something which we, which we don't consider are negotiable we you know why would it be okay in one local authority not to bother with electrical safety but but to do so in another but on other things like um you know where there are issues in the center of edinburgh or in inverness or in the cairngorms or on, on the isle of sky they, they, they will be different and local authorities need to be able to customize and tailor what they do to be no more than is necessary to deal with the particular thing that they're trying to deal with in their area so so um and in terms of registration versus licensing uh what what we are interested in is to get below the kind of headline so so one one of the things with registration that that people talk about is is the ability to register and continue operating so there's no delay but, but what we're talking about with our licensing scheme is for that for those um, people ready operating when the you know before at the time the licensing scheme begins, which applies to everyone on this call, there will be no delay. So so any concern about um, you know applications needing time to be processed doesn't affect anyone on this call. So so there are some. Uh, so, so what I'm interested in is rather than the, 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 the high level labeling, like is this a licensing scheme or registration scheme, is you know, how do we make it work? So we, we are working with the Civic Government of Scotland Act 1982, which sets a, a framework for us. And we, there are some things we have to work within in that act. But um, what we'd like to do is make this, obviously we want to make this as workable for everybody as possible. There's no benefit to Scottish government or local authorities in making this more bureaucratic than it needs to be than it needs to be to deliver its aims. So, um, you know, we're completely open to hearing about suggestions for making it work really in a, in a streamlined and an effective way, but it is going to be a licensing scheme. Um, we, we don't, we, it's not going to be a registration scheme, but in terms of, in terms of the people on this call, the, 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 the biggest, the headline that I get from conversations is about, you know, worrying about whether they can operate when an application's in progress well everyone on this call will be able to so that that's not an issue so okay that's useful to know that that there's there's no hope of kind of going back to a less burdensome and less um troublesome registration scheme which would obviously underpin a license the need for a license a registration would also underpin data required for a tourism tax should that ever come back on the table god forbid um it's really it's really disappointing i have to say because i think that what you're going to find is that the cost of the licensing scheme and the bureaucracy involved of any license scheme is going to mean that a lot of people are going to simply operate under the tape under the radar so actually what you're going to end up with is the people on this call who already operate professionally and um, within every single law and regulatory framework going will continue to do so with an added business burden, financial burden, um, and added bureaucracy. And the people that don't, who are the people that are providing the concern in the first instance, will continue to do so because we don't know where they are. But if there was a free registration, then we would be able to harness the data 
in order to underpin what was required in all of those local authorities going forward for a licensing scheme if required. Uh, just in terms of, of what, what you're talking about, about people sort of going under the wire or whatever, would, it, it would be operating without a license and that will be um, an offence with a, a penalty of 50,000, up to 50,000 pounds. So it'd be quite a dangerous thing for people to try and operate um, under under the radar, as it were. So um, what, one of the things we're, we're, we're there's proposals in the paper about um, kind of data um, and publishing a little bit of data about what's happening in each local authority area. So I think I think if people see um, a lot of activity in due course um, and don't and think it's unlicensed, that they'd, they'd be likely to contact the local authority, and I think it would it would um, uh, be dealt with. So I, I don't think there's going to be any unfair sort of disadvantage for the for the um, if you like the, the honest um, right the people who want to get it right and do the right thing and apply it because I think people who don't are, are rapidly going to find themselves in in some trouble and I think I think um, so so that aspect of the playing field I'm, I I think will will resolve um, I, I when we took when well, sorry, just to say, when we say it's burdensome, I'd, I'd be interested in the in the specifics of what of what makes it burdensome, so that you know, so that we can. Um, if I can't address it now, then I mean, I'd encourage people in their consultation responses. Um, we, we, the consultation form is very short; there's only three um, boxes, three questions, which is what's what are the issues and what are the suggested solutions for the definition for control areas and for licensing. So you don't need to write a great essay. If you've got a problem and a suggested solution, then then please write in with it. Um, but I'm I'm not convinced about this burdensome bureaucracy point. I there's there'll be filling in an application form and paying a fee. Um, but a, aside from that, I'm not really sure. Um, Fiona, do you have something in mind? Well, yeah, I suppose, you know, whilst we've got to remember that this is going to impact on every single business operator in the whole of Scotland, wherever they are, this is really going to have a hugely negative impact on operators in Edinburgh. Edinburgh City Council has already said that they want to shut down every single short term let in a tenement block. You know, can you reassure us that this is not going to become a de facto ban for people in Edinburgh? whilst at the same time being an additional administrative burden, if nothing else, to every single operator across the whole of Scotland. I think that's our, our biggest concern. And it seems like, whilst I always have this analogy, we're looking at a problem largely in Edinburgh, perhaps anecdotally in other places such as Cairngorms and Skye, which really need to look at their housing policy before they look at short-term lets, but that's another conversation. Um, we're, we're, we need a sticking plaster on a cut, but we're actually putting a full body plaster cast across the entire body by this licensing scheme. And I think what the operators in Edinburgh would say is they need an absolute reassurance that they are not going to automatically get shut down because the City of Edinburgh Council fundamentally abhors the very nature of short term letting. Uh, well, ju just on that, I mean, I, I, I do think that the, the sort of variation across Scotland is taken account of in the proposals because, like I say, it's only the, it's, it's the safety aspect which is mandatory, which I think is very justifiable. Everything else is kind of local authority discretion and different local authorities will have different things they want to achieve. But again, it's important to remember that local authorities are not some abstract being. Edinburgh Council is that is the is the elected members that the people of Edinburgh vote for. So um, the, the council will be doing what, um, if you like, the people of Edinburgh ask them to do. And in terms of, I can't I can't tell you exactly what they what they will and won't do. What what I can what the consultation is about is the powers that we're giving all local authorities, and different local authorities might use them differently. But um, so it is up to Edinburgh, the, the City of Edinburgh Council and the people of Edinburgh to decide how, what to do in their area with the powers that we're, we're giving them. 
Um, but but just on just that, to um, sorry on just on that yeah, on that subject, do you does the Scottish government therefore think that local authorities have actually got the capacity to deal with this? Because given that they can't cope with planning issues, licensing issues already, giving them this as a task is potentially going to bring them to their knees. And a lot of people are asking why, for example, a centralised body such as Visit Scotland couldn't take on the scheme rather than local authorities, so that we have less disparity between 30 different, 32 different local authorities. Um, well, it, it's like I say, it's, it's trying to um, get that balance between the things that need to be nationally consistent and the things that are right, rightly varied by by local area. So, um, I mean, I suppose, you know, one could discuss who should administer what bit of it, but the, but there's the, the approach we're going for is that local authorities will administer it. I mean, they have quite a lot of experience from HMO licensing, the private rented sector, all sorts of things that they are already involved with. And there's all sorts of um, licensing, like tattoo parlors and um, premises where people consume alcohol etc so there's 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 quite a lot of local authority experience now in terms of their ability to deliver this this is something we are in in these kind of workshops we're talking to local authority planning licensing environmental health housing etc to try to make sure that um, what we're proposing is deliverable by them so, so in, although it is quite a short period of engagement, we are working hard to speak to all the different people with an interest. So we, we speak to Airbnb and the platforms, the channel managers, all sorts of um, people with an interest in making this work as smoothly as possible to try and make sure that, that the proposals work for them. And I think, um, Fiona, we're going to have um, uh, maybe you and I and one or two others have a, have a sort of more in-depth discussion about the self-catering um, interest in, in, you know, in due course as part of this um, uh, uh, sort of period of consultation. So, um, yeah. So that's I've forgotten the other part of the question, but that, that that's what, what I was going to say on that. So, so as I say, um, we are going to compile all of these questions and present you with a book. Of questions I'm afraid um, but I, we would really value some answers and some responses in due course. Um, we have always really appreciated your pragmatic and evidence-based approach and continue to we will continue to liaise with you really really closely through the next few weeks because we are literally a matter of weeks until this consultation closes. I suppose we're kind of getting to the point where we need to wrap up, but just to reassure everybody that has asked a question today that I haven't got to, we will be answering them and we will be putting them to the delivery group for their consideration. Um, as you can see, this is probably the single biggest threat to our sector, apart from possibly COVID-19. And it is absolutely vital that you get involved. This is the last chance you're gonna to get to make your um, protestations or thoughts known about the licensing proposals but Angie thank you so much for your time and we will be in touch with uh, a few people to have a chat on Friday in some greater depth. I can just assure everyone on this call that the ASSC will be doing everything in their powers to make sure that these proposals result in a scheme that is workable for both businesses and communities and um, that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks, isn't it, Andrew? It is, and we share uh, that aim. We want it to be workable for businesses and communities as well. So, yeah. That's very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much all for your time. Our next, we're taking a little break until um, the, the November. And the next book is about digital reset information on the website. So please get involved in that. It's looking forward. It's, it's how to promote your businesses in a digital way and to get the best out of that. Um, again, thank you all very much indeed for your time. And please continue to be in touch with us. We are going to do whatever we can to support you as a sector. And in the meantime, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>